There's always been something vaguely gross about Kevin O'Leary's approach to investing on Shark Tank. People ask me all the time, why are you so mean on Shark Tank? You're a Get the out of here. Are you worth $10 million? Hell no. I'm not mean. I'm just telling the truth to the experiences I've lived. And for a long time, I've always thought, hey, that's not for me, but to each their own, a lot of different ways to make money. You can ask for anything you want. The answer is no. Great deals, both sides feel paid. But more recently, I've come to realize that Mr. Wonderful is nothing more than a grifter. His entrepreneurial accomplishments are wildly overrated, dating all the way back to his first big payday. And his penchant for maximizing his personal returns while failing to deliver value to his customers continued all the way up to the epic fraud that was FTX. And it's time that more people connected all the dots. This is the story of Shark Tank's lamest shark, Kevin O'Leary. O'Leary has multiple best-selling books, is great at self-promotion, and has ascended to the top tiers of the business gurus. And some business gurus have legit bona fides. When Alex Hormozzi or Gary Vaynerchuk or Russell Brunson give advice, it's born from their ability to build companies doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue profitably. Kevin O'Leary is not one of those guys. After going to business school, O'Leary set up a television production company where he learned that the number one rule was to never be boring on TV. The business didn't go anywhere, but that lesson would stick with him. In 1983, O'Leary saw the potential in the emerging software and personal computer industries. He formed SoftKey Software Products in the basement of his Toronto home, convincing computer companies to bundle his software into their products. By 1993, he took the company public with over $110 million in revenue and a loss of $57 million. To juice growth and to paper over his losses, O'Leary grew by making a series of acquisitions. SoftKey's most prominent move was the hostile takeover of the San Francisco-based The Learning Company. Prior to the sale, The Learning Company hired a forensic accounting firm to examine O'Leary's financials. After investigating, the Center for Financial Research and Analysis alleged that SoftKey overstated its earnings by bundling various general and administrative costs into its write-offs. The CFRA also noted that SoftKey's audit committee holds several questionable members, including the CEO, as well as an outside member associated with two public companies charged with financial improprieties and another member who is a paid consultant to the company. Interestingly, SoftKey had separately fired its auditor, Arthur Anderson, after the accounting firm found deficiencies in their internal controls. Yet O'Leary was able to push the acquisition through, and he immediately ditched the name SoftKey and took the name The Learning Company. The company continued to grow via acquisitions, driving revenue up over $800 million. But an SEC filing shows that The Learning Company suffered net losses of 376 million in 1996, 495 million in 97, and 105 million in 1998. That same year, the company's accumulated debts topped $1.1 billion. The learning company was ready to topple over and O'Leary knew he needed to get out. He just needed a sucker that would take the bait. And he found one in Mattel. The toy giant initiated a takeover bid without doing proper due diligence. Mattel's stock was cratering under CEO Jill Ballard, and she was hoping that educational software could be a driver of future growth. The takeover shocked many because everyone in the software industry knew that the learning company was a house of cards burdened with tired brands. So much inventory was piling up that they had to repackage their products and distribute them in convenience stores and drug stores. Mattel overlooked all of this and purchased the learning company for nearly $4 billion in the spring of 1999. O'Leary took over as president of Mattel's new digital division. In the third quarter of 1999, Mattel expected profits of $50 million from their new digital division. Instead, it was a loss of $105 million. 
the next quarter, losses climbed to 200 million. And in half a year, $2 billion of shareholder value was incinerated by the learning company acquisition. This all led to a shareholder lawsuit where a Mattel executive accused the learning company of stuffing channels, meaning they shipped product at the end of the quarter, recorded it as revenue, even though most of the merchandise would end up being returned. In short, O'Leary sold Mattel a lemon. And another investor lawsuit claimed that O'Leary cashed in his Mattel shares just before the losses were announced, when the stock peaked for as much as $6 million. By November of 1999, O'Leary was fired just six months in to a three-year contract. Mattel CEO Jill Barrett was forced out four months later. There is nothing I can say to gloss over how devastating the learning company's results have been to Mattel's overall performance, Barrett said as she went out the door. Mattel briefly tried to turn the learning company around, but in 2000, they traded away their multi-billion dollar acquisition for $27 million and a right to some future profits. The purchase was later labeled by Business Week, one of the worst deals of all time. Mattel eventually settled that investor lawsuit for $122 million, which was considered a mega deal at the time. O'Leary denied all allegations and blamed Mattel for all the problems. While his actions cost Mattel investors billions of dollars, he walked away with a cool 11 million. Now, after pulling off such a heist, some people would just retire, play golf, relax. Not O'Leary. He began to appear on Canadian business and financial television, became a regular on the Business News Network, and eventually got his own show, Squeeze Play. This led him to be one of the investors on a show called Dragon's Den, which was the Canadian precursor to Shark Tank. O'Leary felt it was time to cash in on his newfound fame and start another business. He launched O'Leary Funds, a mutual fund focused on generating yield for investors, despite not having a background in investing and having denigrated mutual funds on TV previously. One of O'Leary's primary selling points in the early days was that he wouldn't grind the capital of his investors, meaning he wouldn't use principal to pay back his investors' yield. Astute investors can generate dividends through savvy investing. Bad investors can't. And the funds took off growing to as much as $1.5 billion in assets under management. Remember, he's a good self-promoter. Yet it wasn't long after launching that sharp-eyed experts realized that O'Leary in fact was paying dividends to his investors with their very own cash. In other words, grinding their capital. The analysis found that up to one-fourth of all distributions from O'Leary's funds were just the return of capital. Now, other investors also grind their capital. This isn't unheard of, but this was his primary selling point for people joining it. By 2012, the funds were in trouble, falling to just $1 billion in assets under management by the end of the year. In 2014, O'Leary Funds agreed to pay penalties for violating certain technical provisions of the Securities Act. And in 2015, O'Leary Funds was sold to Canoe Financial, down to just $800 million in assets. And I should mention that the Canoe Financial guy got really wealthy by financing the Dragon's Den show. So this was maybe a little bit of a life boom. The fund sank for a simple reason, poor performance, redemptions. Investors were pulling their money out because they knew that there were a lot of other places to get better results. The majority of O'Leary funds had performed poorly for an extended period of time. And the majority of brokers stopped selling it to their clients. But once again, O'Leary made his money. You can make some really nice management fees on 1 billion in assets under management just didn't deliver anything for his customers. But all of these moves were setting up for Mr. Wonderful's magnum opus. A blend of financial ignorance, naked self-promotion, and exploitation of his audience. This is O'Leary talking about crypto around 2018-2019. It's still <laughs> garbage, and I'm not going to take real money and put it into this thing. It's never going to happen. Just a few years later, Mr. Wonderful completely changed his tune. Look, Bitcoin is not a coin, Joe. It's simply software. If you own Microsoft, if you own Google, why don't you own Bitcoin? It's all software. I have millions of dollars. 20% of my portfolio is now in cryptocurrencies wow. and blockchain. 
He even changed his Twitter profile to a photo of him with glowing blue eyes, which is an indicator of a mega crypto bull. Why would he do this? Well, because he saw a way to make a quick buck. O'Leary was paid approximately $15 million by FTX to act as a spokesperson for the crypto exchange. He appeared on television, in ads, and podcasts, espousing the benefits of crypto and FTX to anyone that would listen. But when it was revealed that Sam Bankman Fried was actually operating the largest Ponzi scheme since Bernie Madoff, O'Leary was caught in a tricky spot. If he turned on SBF, he would basically be admitting that he did no due diligence before accepting both compensation and equity. Additionally, his close relationship with SBF, they talked on the phone regularly, kind of begged the question, did he not see any of the red flags? But on the other hand, he didn't want to argue that everything FTX did was above board. This was a headline-grabbing financial crime. So instead, Mr. Wonderful put up his hands and said, I don't know. I lost about $16 million there as a paid spokesperson. I looked like an idiot during that time, as so did many others, because this, to me, was a startup. I was like everybody else, realizing this was a nascent startup. So we're supposed to believe that a guy who sells himself as a savvy investor on Shark Tank, who eviscerates small business owners for holes in their business plan and their business model, couldn't see that SBF had set up a house of cards. And if his time on Shark Tank didn't prepare him, wouldn't his experience selling the carcass of the learning company to Mattel inform him on what to look for? Consider me skeptical. Now, if your goal is just to be a grifter, then maybe you can take O'Leary's story as your blueprint for success. But if you wanna build a real business, satisfy your customers, hire loyal employees, and be a force for good on the world, then I would recommend you steer clear of Kevin O'Leary's advice. He doesn't know how to build healthy businesses. He is not good at conducting due diligence on his investments. And at the end of the day, he's just in it for himself. And I don't expect that this video will bring O'Leary down. If you ever heard of Brandolini's Law, it says, that it takes 10 times more effort to refute than it takes to create it. And O'Leary creates a lot of bull. Thanks for watching.